you know, standing here just like talking it out makes it sound so simple. Greetings adventurers, my name is Kramer and today I'm just taking you behind the scenes a little bit because I've been working on a pair of leather pauldrons non-stop for pretty much the past two weeks. I mean, of course, taking breaks to eat and sleep and, and take care of household chores, but pretty much eight to six hours a day, this is what I've been working on. One is complete and I'm gonna show you how I made the second one. So this isn't a tutorial, it is just a little behind the scenes work here um, as I'm putting together my Rohan look because it, it's just not, it's simply not done yet. And I need to do it right, otherwise it's not really worth doing at all. Um, there will be a link right here if you're watching this in the future and th that video is out. I'm hoping to have it done next week. There's still a lot of stuff I need to do after the pauldrons are done, but I, I really want to capture that look that um, that Weta Workshop did in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings. So that's, that's coming. The reason I chose these ones specifically is because of the way this top portion is designed. They have these two pieces that sort of have this seam right here in the center and it almost has this, this sort of shelf thing going. And it, that to me looked a lot like the pauldrons that Eomir and Theoden wear in Peter Jackson's The Lord of the Rings. I liked that a lot. They weren't, these weren't designed to look like that. That's just a connection I made and that's why I chose these. This is not a tutorial um, and I'm not going to go into detail about how the entire thing is made because I didn't design this. This is a pattern from a company called Black Raven Armory, which I purchased um, with my own money because I liked the design. So I'm not affiliated with Black Raven Armory. I just like what they had to offer. Um, so the link for Black Raven Armory is in the description, but I don't get anything from that. I'm just sharing the love and letting you know if you want to check them out. They've got patterns. They've got uh, lessons for you for leather working with their Black Raven Academy. It's a really cool thing. And there are other companies that do that as well. I'm not playing favorites. Uh, this is just what I happen to have at the moment, but I'd be open to looking at other companies and working with them too. So setting aside that the first step is actually just to print out the patterns so that you can copy onto your leather and cut out all the pieces. These pauldrons have a lot of tooling, a lot of carving work in them. So the first step that I did was actually to transfer all of that tooling onto tracing paper so that I could then transfer that onto the leather. So after cutting out uh, all of the main pieces of the pauldron, I then separate out all of the ones that need to have carving done. I then case those. If you're not familiar, leatherworking casing is when you just cover the top portion of the leather, the skin side. You're not soaking the whole thing, just the skin side in water so that it can uh, better accept tooling marks. So I trace those onto the leather itself, being very careful that it's as even as I can make it. I'm a human being, so obviously I make mistakes, but you don't need to know that. <laughs> and then after the leather has dried for about 10 minutes, so it's not too mushy, I'm gonna go ahead and take my swivel knife and I'm just going to cut all of those lines in. And you can probably begin to see why this takes so long. If I were just making the pauldrons without doing any of the tooling and detailing, I could have finished these in about a day. Um, but the tooling process does take a lot of time. And this is only my third project actually tooling something. I made a helmet and I made some bracers um, and now I'm making these pauldrons. So I don't have a lot of experience tooling, which is why it is taking so long. So after I have first traced the patterns from the copy paper onto the tracing paper and then traced the patterns from the tracing paper onto the leather, and then traced the leather with the swivel knife to cut the actual design into the leather itself, I then have to go around the entire thing with a beveler. And that is to round off the edges and really highlight um, the actual lines of this Celtic design. Now, the way that Celtic knot designs like this work is that there are at least two lines, in this case there are more, that go crisscross underneath and then over each other in that pattern. And as you can see on the leather without doing any of the beveling, it's really difficult to really even tell what you're looking at. It just looks like a whole bunch of cuts. You can maybe see that there's a pattern there, but it doesn't look very clean. But once I go around the outsides of each of those lines with a beveler, it becomes much more clear what the actual shape of the design is supposed to be. And this can get very tricky because you're just doing the outsides of the lines, meaning that you are um, doming 
and matting down the spaces in between those lines. And sometimes you can mistake a space for being a line itself and then you bevel the wrong side and then all of a sudden you have a mushy little project you're working on. So you have to be very careful when you're going back and forth like that. So that takes a long time. The two main pieces of the pauldron have between three and five individual uh, tooled pieces. And each one of those larger sections takes about an hour to trace, then carve, and then bevel. And then after I'm done beveling everything, we're still not done because then I have to use a backgrounder. Well, I don't have to. I want to because it looks much better. The problem is I don't have a backgrounder that is small enough to get into those spaces. And a backgrounder usually has a textured pattern on it, and that just sinks the leather in the background of the project down so that the actual design can come up into the forefront. And then it has this uh, 3D textured feel. It's not just a drawing, it actually has layers to it. So what I'm doing is I'm actually using the, the point end of a snap setter to individually go around the leather and mat it down and it ends up with this nice little uh, spotted texture look and that allows me to get into those small little areas that need to be depressed so that the actual design can come to the forefront. After all of that is done, which is a lot of hammer work, let me tell you, now I can dye the piece. I'm using Fibings Pro Dye, the golden brown color, and I'm just daubing that on uh, because the theme that we're going to notice here uh, is that I will go to extreme lengths, even to the point of it taking even more time to complete a project in order to not have to have more steps in the project. So for me, pouring the dye into a bowl so that I could then use a larger applicator will like in my mind take more time than using the tiny little dauber just dipping it into the bottle itself. So uh, I dip the dauber into the bottle rather than pouring it out and probably making my life a lot easier uh, in the long run. So now we get to play the waiting game, which is another reason why projects like this take so long is because there's so many pieces. Even if I'm letting one piece dry while it's dying and then carving another piece at the same time, it still ends up taking a lot of time. And while we're waiting for that leather to dry, I can tell you about today's video sponsor, Skillshare. I am constantly on the search for new skills to learn in order to add to my video making arsenal. Now I'm only one man, but I want to have a production style that makes it seem like I have a whole team behind me. And there is an absolute lot to cover, but that's why I really appreciate the structure of Skillshare because a good teacher with a well thought out lesson plan will tell you everything that you need to know and answer questions that you didn't even know you had before you've even thought to ask them so that you can spend your time just learning rather than figuring out what it is that you need to learn in the first place. I've been working through the course Motion Capture Animation by Lucas Ridley because I want to know more about 3D modeling. Now I probably should have started with a beginner course because I have no clue what I'm doing. Yet. Man, it's so complicated. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for anyone who wants to explore their creativity and learn new skills. The first 1,000 people to use my special link in the description will get one month free so you can explore classes on filmmaking, character illustration, creative writing. The search for knowledge is endless. So check out Skillshare with the link below in the description and a huge thank you to them for sponsoring this video. The next step after roughing up everything is to add an antiquing gel. An antiquing gel is meant to sink down into the crevices so you can highlight the actual cuts and the divots and it will make everything pop a whole lot more. So that goes on and then you wipe off all of the excess immediately and then we get to let it dry again on all of the pieces. And then what I'm doing on this one is I'm actually going over the design section with a wire brush. And again, we will notice this theme. I had to get up and go into the other room in order to get that section of the wire brush. But the Dremel that it went with was in this room. Um, and I didn't want to have to go into two rooms. So I just grabbed the wire tool and I'm like manually using it on the leather for some reason, rather than just like going to get the, uh, rather than just going to get the actual Dremel so that I could do it much more quickly. But th that's that's a my brain thing. Don't worry, don't, I'm fine, don't worry about me. And the reason that we're going over this with the wire brush is actually to take some of that dye off of the main uh, design so that it is highlighted. Now I could have chosen to just dye the individual depressed sections and leave the uh, design completely clean, but I didn't want it to be that highlighted because I want to give it a look as if it's kind of old, lived in, as if it's been made maybe 
a number of years ago rather than being brand new and shiny and nice like here on my helmet on my helmet here is an example of if I don't dye the actual design itself and I leave that the, the neutral leather color it stands out a lot it looks very nice but it doesn't have that quite lived in look that I was going for with the pauldrons and then after that finally goes my wax and that just goes on I let it sit for 10 minutes and then I buff it out and that just makes it nice and shiny it's not waterproof uh, but it is slightly water resistant now with this particular design it's not just the pauldron itself that's carved there's actually an overlay that goes on top of it thickening the armor a little bit more making it a little bit more robust but also creating this little window as if there is the pauldron and then there is a cutout in the pauldron and then inside the cutout that's where the carving is so that's even more cutting and so with these overlays i'm doing a lot of extra work here too that is not entirely necessary i'm going through and i'm beveling all the insides of the windows just so they sink down a little bit more it's a little more visually pleasing to me um i think than having uh that sort of harsh angle so i'm using an edge beveler Another example of how uh, <laughs> I'm cutting corners for time. These little tiny edge bevelers that I'm using are supposed to go into a handle. They're, it's like a kit. The edge bevelers are exchangeable if there's one handle. Um, but instead of swapping them, I just use the edge bevelers on their own because I don't want to have to take the time to like unscrew the tiny little screw in the handle in order to put the edge bevelers in. My life would be easier if I just did that, but that's neither here nor there. And on these overlay pieces, when I put two pieces of leather together that sandwich, I only edge bevel the top layer because when they stick together, I don't want there to be like a weird little lip on the inside where the two pieces touch each other. I want that to be nice and square. So I'm only doing the top. And you'll also notice that when you're doing cuts like this, especially with the leather that I'm working with right now, there are lots of fibers that tend to stick out. And those can be very difficult to cut away with a knife because they move, they're supple, and they just sort of bend around. They can be very, very annoying. Corners are always the hardest part to like get clean for me. So what I've started doing is I'll take a lighter and I just run that along the edge and that burns away any of those tiny little uh, fibers that are sticking out. You want to be careful not to burn the actual leather. It doesn't smell very good, um, but it, that's a nice way to quickly clean up those little straggling strands that, that come out of the leather there. So after that is done, I now have to dye the overlay. After I waited for the overlay to dry, then I add the wax to the overlay, let that dry, buff that out, and then I can glue that onto the base piece, which is the piece that has the carving on it. But the trick that I'm using here is I'm actually overcutting the, the overlay. And what that means is that I'm not cutting it to the size of the pattern. I'm cutting it just slightly bigger than the pattern on all of the edges. I'm going to fill in the center by cutting out those actual windows. And then I'm going to use those windows as a guide when I glue the two of them together so that I can then cut away the excess around the first carved piece, which is the one that is fit to the actual template. And then everything is gonna to fit together a lot more seamlessly. It's not gonna have rough edges or anything everywhere. Both pieces are gonna fit like they were one single piece. And don't get confused, I am working with two separate pieces here. I'm like going back and forth. These two pieces are gonna get put together later so if they look different i'm not cheating they're just they're just different pieces of the armor once everything is flush and the way i want it i then go around and bevel the edges of the entire piece both the top and the bottom and then i use my slicker just to round off those edges make them nice and smooth because those are the ends that are going to be exposed uh, and seen by other people and I want those to be nice and clean and I also don't want edges digging into like my skin on my armor on my neck I want those to be nice and round and comfortable and now I can go ahead and punch the holes I'm wary of punching holes on two separate pieces that have to be glued together independently if I can avoid it because there's always the chance that I'm going to be slightly off and then when the holes are misaligned, it just gets really, really ugly. So now that the pieces are glued, I'm going to mark where all of those holes need to be punched, and then I'm going to punch them out, and then rivets go into those holes. And that just helps to hold those two pieces together. It makes it a little bit more firm, and it's a little bit of decoration as well, because that glue is going to hold, but once it starts getting wet, like if it's pouring outside, then we start running into issues potentially. So that's, that's a pretty quick, or maybe it wasn't quick, depending on the edit. That was a pretty quick rundown of what it took to put together one piece 
of this pauldron. Um, and technically there is supposed to be five. I made a slight edit um, just so that it lands at the proper length for my arms. I'm only using four pieces rather than five. Once all of those pieces are done, all of the holes are punched, everything is antiqued, everything is carved, everything is waxed, everything is dyed, everything has its edges beveled and slicked, then I can assemble everything. So the pieces that are going to come down the arm here are going to get riveted together with these little straps, which I also had to cut. And I'm not dying those ones on purpose because I like the I like the aesthetic idea that there's like the armor that's been dyed and it's been carved and it looks really, really nice. And like maybe I'm not an artisan, but an artisan theoretically has created this armor. And then the straps, no one's going to see the straps. So the straps were just put together by like an apprentice or something like that. They weren't dyed, they're rough and then they just get thrown onto the armor in order to hold it together. So that was on purpose. The pieces here are going to get riveted together with these two straps. Those are then going to be wet on the back so that I can uh, curve them and wet mold them gently, and those are going to have to sit overnight. And this top piece here still has a little bit more work into it. There's these two pieces, and they are going to get sewn together. And the way they've been designed is that because the curves go away from each other, when you actually stitch them together, it is already going to form this sort of dome shape. Once that is stitched together, that also gets wet on the back and then curved and formed. And once both separate sets of plates are curved and formed, then finally I can rivet them together and we will have a pauldron, finally. And it feels like it's actually taken ages for me to do this. And on the back here, we put one single buckle on a strap here, and that is so it can attach to another strap that I have to put on my breastplate. And that's just gonna hang right there. I think it's a really good length. I did briefly think about attaching just a regular piece of leather back here with two holes punched so that I had the buckle option and I had the option to attach it with arming points, but I ended up not doing that and just going for the buckle because it's easier. And if worse comes to worse, I can always I can always use arming points later. I'll figure it out somehow. What I'm really doing here is I'm trying to copy to the best of my ability uh, Richard Taylor's um, philosophy when it came to designing all of the props and costume. Well, he didn't design the costumes. All of the props and the armor and stuff like that for The Lord of the Rings. Richard Taylor was the, I think, uh, creative director or artistic director of Weta while Peter Jackson was working on The Lord of the Rings. And, and that man essentially went to his team and he said, I wish I could remember the exact quote. This is a paraphrase. If you can't approach this as if it is the most important thing you have ever done in your life and treat it with that reverence and respect, then you don't deserve to be here. And he said that to his team day one. And I just think that's so awesome because he poured his heart and his soul into making those movies. And I, when I'm sitting here at my desk, making one single pauldron, taking an entire week to make just one pauldron, I think about those guys knitting chain mail together for two straight years and doing nothing but that for the Lord of the Rings. And I just think that's why those movies are so good because that is the amount of, I'm not, I'm not comparing myself. They're much better than me, but that is the amount of dedication that I aspire to have when I'm when I'm making my own kit here. So, so I'm, that's why I'm I'm telling myself that's why I'm going the extra mile to like bevel the insides of all the windows and dye the back here and, and putting thought into whether or not these back straps are dyed and stuff like that. Just because I'm I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best to honor Richard Taylor. This is the van brace that I made recently, also available from Black Raven Armory. Um, he didn't design these to look like Lord of the Rings. I just picked this one because I think the scales look very Rohan ask in my opinion, but look at this buckles. If you've been watching me for a while, you know, my feeling about leather van braces with, uh, with laces. I really, I cordially dislike them. I'll use them if I have to. Some of them have been comfortable, but I really prefer straps. And now I have straps. Should I put it on? I'll put it on. There you go. Nice. There's a, there's a nice little sneak peek for you. Another hint that I can offer you here for when you're putting things together is check out Jason Kingsley, Modern History TV's video on his full uh, jousting harness. The video is linked here and also in the description. The, the description is going to be chock full of information for you this time, so definitely check it out. But I reference that video all of the time just to see how actual plate armor is supposed to look and supposed to function 
there's even stuff in there that I, I go to look for. He doesn't necessarily even talk about it because why would you? But um, I, I need to know that information and I trust him as a source. Like the direction that, that the straps on certain pieces of armor are supposed to be facing, like I suppose I could intuit that, right? But one way or the other, there's not really a way that I can tell whether the long strap is supposed to be on top and buckle down here or if the buckle's supposed to be up here and then strap up. I mean, having the strap down here and buckle up here would almost be easier to buckle myself, but the way it is on the historical armor that he's got, the straps are on the top and the buckle's on the bottom, so that is the way that I'm doing it. Same thing with the pauldrons here. The straps go around the front of the arm and the buckles are in the back. Makes it a little more difficult to put on by yourself, but I can tell myself that this is slightly more accurate this way. Are you proud of me, Richard Taylor? Okay, it's like 1 a.m. and my other pauldron is just sitting there on the floor waiting for me to finish it. So that is gonna wrap this video up for today, but definitely check out the description because Black Raven Armory is linked down there, Skillshare is linked down there, as well as Weaver Leathercraft and Skill Trees channels are both linked down there as well. If you are just starting Leathercraft and you want actual like good tutorials, for you to do starting projects or maybe even some more complicated projects with both those channels, they will be linked down there as well. So I'm gonna hop back to it. I will see you next time. And in the meantime, I'd like to wish you good luck on your adventures and look forward to next week's video, which will be linked if you're watching this in the future so that you can see what the whole ensemble looks like when I put it together.